What's up? What's up, everyone? It's your boy Agassino. Welcome to our episode of the Agassino Zinger Show, episode number 76. 76. 7 and a 6 and a 7 6. How the hell are you guys doing, man? Hope you're well hydrated, rested, chilled out, feeling good. I'm feeling good. You know, I've got the little fuck skank going on here, you know? And if you're listening to this on the, on audio and you're not listening to watch this on video, then what I'm specifically doing is raising my arms up into this sort of like weird sort of shuffle motion, right? My arms parallel and I'm shuffling up and down, up and down, while at the same time moving my head and sometimes moving a bit of my shoulder. That's the fucking dance, right? No one does that too much these days, but that's how we like to start off the Exodus English show episode number 76 because we like to be a bit, you know, unconventional, you know? We like to come in through the fucking back door. And when I mean back door, I mean your bum hole. When we in your bum hole, I mean the garden. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited as fuck, man. Can you tell? Um, yeah, how, how are you guys? I hope you're well. I'm fucking amazing. I'm feeling good. This is third time lucky, though. You would, you didn't know that. That's probably why I feel good and I feel like I've had a bit of rehearsal. I recorded it the first time. I didn't plug my microphone in. The second time I recorded it, the video was so laggy. You know what was so laggy, though? Because I'm trying to run 1080p on the MacBook that's from, like, 2004 doesn't work man so i've lowered the, i've lowered the bit rate um so i've lowered the resolution i've kind of got the bit rate down to a love a nice level and it's encoding just about right that i'm hoping today's video will be not that laggy and i'm hoping that the audio will be super crispy because i'm holding the microphone right to my lips so when i rec- upload this onto the podcast app on youtube and all the other stuff i mean sorry on um, itunes you must listen to me and hear me nice and clearly through whatever audio visual device that you are using man oh man oh man hope you're well but yeah i'm good man i'm tired as fuck though man just been to the gym had a nice sort of workout that was and then that was after i did a three mile run on a monday and i'm gonna pound it again tomorrow and do a probably a four mile or five mile run tomorrow depending on how i feel when i wake up you know because when i wake up i make my choices dead because i'm a bad boy um but yeah i've been fairly tired man i've been fairly fairly knackered and a lot of it has to do with my own fuck-ups i guess um i've been fortunate enough these last couple of weeks i've been djing a lot more than i've been djing um as of late in general so with that it has meant that I've been going out more often because usually if I'm not DJing, I don't turn I don't tend to go out unless I'm gonna see a DJ, right? I'm all about nightlife culture. I fucking obsess and love nightlife culture. So if it's not really nightlife, I'm not going out. But when I do DJ, I like to go out and get fucked up. Cause you know, the only the best part about London, I think, in my opinion, the best way to get the kind of spontaneity feel of London that you'd get when you go on holiday or when you go to a place like Berlin to be Pacific, right? You go into a nice club in Berlin, you hang out with some cool people, you're wearing a great jacket, you've got a great little vintage um, leather biker on, you're hanging out with some cool people, right? Someone's going to come up to you and say, wow, man, I love your accent, man, I love this, love that, whatever, and they're going to get sh- talking shit with you, and all of a sudden you're going to end up at some someone's house party in the middle of Kreuzberg, and you'll be like, wow, love Berlin. Now, that might only happen to me because I'm a bit of an extrovert and I love to be the centre of attention and shit, but... I think in general, I've seen that happen even with bigger groups of people who are with me, who have also been um, encouraged to come along, right? The kind of person that usually doesn't want to go and be like, no, I'm going to go home when they're at home, right? Or when they're at home base, they will tend to kind of go with the flow when they're abroad. But we don't tend to do that here in London. My theory is that the reason why we don't do that is because a lot of people pay so much money for rent, right? Too much, an exorbitant amount of money for rent. The other day I saw someone advertising a flat somewhere in Hackney Central for 800 pound a month. I'm assuming without bills because usually if it's with bills, they'll let it be known in a blur because with bills is part, it's like a, it's a, it's, it's a way to draw people into the advertisement, right? If you are selling a flat or if you are offering a flat or a room in a flat for 700 quid, including bills, everyone will kind of bite a hand off of it, right? Because you're, you know, it's the assumption that, oh my God, £700 only, that means I'll have XYZ left after rent. Blah, 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 blah. So imagine paying £800 uh, a month for rent in Hackney. You're not, you don't have any, you don't have uh, bills included or any of your other life admin stuff, such as weekly shopping, such as bills or whatever you have to do, such as even going out, money, blah, 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 blah. Plus, most of my friends who are operating within the, um, the the cultural landscape aren't necessarily in a position that they'd want to be in for the rest of their life, right? They're not working a job of their dreams. They're usually working somewhere just to pay the bills, to keep the lights on, keep a roof over their head, right? So for the most part, you're not earning an absorbent amount of money or you're not earning enough money to justify your style of living, right? Or to even kind of come close to your style of living or the, living, or the style of living that you'd, what you're aspiring to. 
So let's say, for instance, you might be earning £1,300 a month, maybe the highest £1,500 a month, right? You take out 800 quid a month for rent. That doesn't leave too much when you account for travel, right? Underground travel, when you account for even buying a bike, when you account for buying drinks or going out. Plus, we don't have that... We, our open spaces aren't that great in London, right? Um, I'd say open spaces are probably quite shit um when i mean over spaces i mean if you want to meet up your friend right you're you are always funneled into going into a pub or a bar because our open spaces and parks aren't plentiful and when they are plentiful they're in the pacific area they might not be right next to where you work right they might not be where you hang out in general then on top of that you have the scourge that if you are going to be in a park or you're going to hang out on a bench, the benches aren't designed for you to sit down, right? They've all got armrests on them, so homeless people can't lay down and sleep on them. They've got skate stoppers on any sort of concrete block or bench because skaters skate on them and grind them and shit. But then that obviously leads to you again sitting in a sort of like one per person kind of block. It's not very um, conducive to people gathering around. There's not very, there's not many places where you can sit down in a circle and kind of huddle around and drink beers and shit. Some places because people take their piss, they don't allow people to. to to drink or whatever or they have police monitoring the areas or i don't know it's just in a residential area where it makes you feel a bit weird sitting down in the grass somewhere where there's houses all around it it's just not designed in a way to allow people to quickly make connections or to gather around to quickly shoot the shit with their friend before they head off home so everything has to take part in a nightclub or a bar so then when you're a spontaneous guy like me and you go out and you happen to go in this nightclub or a bar where everyone's being clicky and being weird you're like oh my god i hate london when really it's it's a reaction to the circumstances they're living in. Because if you're a girl and you're working, busting your ass six days a week or five days a week, working during the week, right? You have no time to meet your friends. So when you do finally meet your friends, the last thing you want to do is invite this motherfucker into your group, right? And like a little straggle along, like to join in. And if you start chatting to you, go, go tell me to fuck off, right? You want to spend time with your friend and catch up and gossip and shoot the shit. I get it. But I love spontaneity. That's why when I DJ, it always goes overboard and sometimes it gets a bit too crazy. At the moment, I've been able to manage it better because it's helped that I'm DJing at Tappy East. I'm DJing in uh, Le- uh, um, the Heathcote and Stars in Leighton Stone, which are in walking distance from my house. And they're not, they're not in an area that would allow me to go and have an after party, right? Even the Tap East. It's kind of near Hackneywick and not really near Hackneywick. It's like a still 20-minute walk to get there, right? So... It's, it requires it requires real determination for me to go out and, go, and get fucked up right after a DJ set. But it sometimes does happen. So because of that and because of my uh, strenuous workout regime that requires me to go to the gym at least five days a week, I kind of crashed the other day. I had a massive headache. My allergies flared up. I was rubbing my eyes. My nose was leaking all over the gaff. And I just thought, you know what? I need to kind of rebalance myself and get myself back into an even kill. And then from then on, I can kind of progress. And obviously, since I've got a DJ set happening on a Friday and Saturday coming up at the end of this week, I kind of want to kind of rest this week and kind of just relax and take it easy. So in the spirit of taking easy, cheers! You know, got some uh, one pan eighty seven cider from Lidl with loads of ice in there because it's my day off and I'm chilling. So cheers to everyone out there. I kind of actually fasted um, for 18 hours a day. So I'm aiming probably to do that again um, um, today and tomorrow. And probably to end of the week, kind of a fast 16 to 18 hours, which has been great. I love working out faster, than actually. It's, you feel so much lighter, which goes about saying, I guess, isn't it? Because the, the last meal I'm probably going to eat, looking at the clock, might be in about an hour or two. It's been my last meal. And then from that, I'll just kind of rest and kind of zone out until the end of the day. But anyway, enough about my um, eating habits, workout regime, love for nightlife, and my penchant for getting fucked up. Let's get into some topics, man. God damn. Um, number one, start off on a bit of a somber note. Um, I guess R.I.P. and thoughts and prayers go out to Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain's family. Um, they back-to-back suicides, it kind of felt like. I think they were separated maybe only by a couple of days. Um, Kate Spade, an inter- in influential fashion designer, impersonal socialite personality within the New York um, creative scene. And then obviously Anthony Bourdain, one of the leading voices in the culinary world, restaurant world, travel world kind of the person that basically laid the framework or the blueprint for travel shows that you see today and how they kind of run, you know, the kind of solo traveler, the idea of going to different parts of the world and and kind of um, putting uh, food or culinary delights that are necessarily given the limelight and giving them the platform that exposes it to a wider public, the idea of breaking bread with people in their natural habitat, um, the idea of embracing the rough edges. Um, Both of them were influential people and, yeah, man, it's been a fucking crazy week because obviously 
um, a couple, a few months ago, a friend of mine or someone that I've known for a while who used to be a security guard at quite a lot of clubs I used to play for in Trinity Park of East London, at Dawson, Shore, this one of those kind of places. He supposedly, not supposed, but he did take his life to, and that took, and that hit me quite hard too because I remember speaking to him a lot about his depression after work and him feeling a bit down and stuff and, you know, suddenly then he's gone, he's not around anymore. Um, but I was unable to get any more, glean any more information from the whole issue, issue because his family kind of kept it private. I'm assuming through maybe some weird sense of shame because, you know, a lot of African, black, Caribbean families have a weird, um, have a weird correlation with, kind of correlate suicide with something evil, you know? It's like, um, it's a sin against God. You're taking your own life, you know, because obviously every life is meant to be precious and stuff and you're made in the image of God. So taking your own life is kind of like you're spitting in God's face. So there's a weird uh, thing that, black people have with suicide in general so i've assumed that's the reason why they want to put any more information out or it could just be they wanted to keep it private and didn't want anyone else to get involved i can understand that too but i didn't really get that much information for, about what aiden's death was and you know whether not to help out nothing really came out of there in that regard so that was a bit sad but it kind of made me did think it made, it made it made me reflect a lot on life in general and kind of the things that some people complain about it kind of made me prioritize some of the stuff that i'm thinking about um, and also kind of maybe um, it kind of reset my ambitions and my way that I kind of kind of going to conduct myself in life in general. Um, I've kind of always had a bit of a practical way of looking at these kind of things, but sometimes when it happens to someone very close to you, it kind of kind of knock you back a bit. And I guess in terms of Kate Spade, it was sometimes uh, something as well that was it did come out of the blue mostly because you know Anthony Bourdain at least had a history of drugs had maybe if you read in between lines of some of his recent interviews and a bit of his book he did kind of suffer from some forms of depression but most of it had to do because you know he was a by his own space by his own words he was a he was a complete failure until maybe his early early 40s right so he he kind of was trying to do the work but it never kind of worked out and everyone around him was succeeding and you know working in the restaurant industry working in any sort of service industry at that kind of age you, it does kind of fuck up with your head right it kind of makes you does think it kind of do think maybe i'm not as successful as i should be maybe I'm a bit of a failure i'm a disappointment to my family blah 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 so at least with anti bourdain there's a bit of a context there even though he was clean for most for most of his life you know since he came into the limelight and stuff in terms of uh hard drugs he was still drinking stuff but in terms of hard drugs that kind of really held him down in terms of heroin and coke and stuff he wasn't doing that as much as he was doing that um, he was doing it before so but at least with anthony bourdain you can kind of uh you can not understand but you can there's there's more context to it right but with kate spade it didn't it kind of it kind of came out of the blue because i met anthony spade once when i went to andy spade sorry when i went to um new york for the first time in 2009 um we went for our first kind of boys holiday uh, me and a group of friends uh who kind of were, were kind of prominent in the london uh streetwear blogging kind of era they used to run this site called bntl which I'm pretty sure is still around now, but in its original incarnation, it kind of, you know, highlighted all the sick, amazing stuff that was happening in London um, because I, that, it kind of came out after the the whole hype stuff that was mostly LA and Hong Kong, LA, LA, New York and Hong Kong based, right? Mostly because it's based in Hong Kong, wherever, or like Japanese kind of centric and BNTL did a good job of highlighting brands within London that were doing cool and interesting things. So... We went over to New York in 2009, had an amazing trip. And during that time too, I also had my own blog called Stop Begging that was fairly well known within the scene. And I happened to connect with Heron Preston online. We became kind of like email pen pal guys, whatever, exchanging comments, whatever. I used to steal the theme of his website quite often, which I'm sure he was aware of. <laughs> um, and then I went over to New York and met him. And then we were, we, were, we were eating and drinking in this place. I think it's called like Esquina or something, some bar in New York, right? That's got like a, it's sort of like a camper van. I'm trying to get it up. Uh, let me see if I can try to get it up. La Esquina. Is it La Esquina? La Esquina, New York. Let's see if it's the one. That's why I remember bumping into, um, her, uh, I remember bumping into Andy Spade in this place. Let's see if I can get it up on the version. Yeah, here we go. Boom. So, went to New York had an amazing time and met Heron Preston in this bar, right? It's called La Esquina. It's a restaurant bar in New York. So as you see from the pictures, I'll hopefully you can see it if you're watching it on YouTube. If not, you can, I'll, I'll link everything on the show notes. But basically, it's this bar in um, in New York that serves like tacos and watermelon juice and shit. Really, really nice. But then it's amazing because once you go, you can you go through the kitchen 
to get through this, to get downstairs into this like secret bar that looks like that downstairs, right? Really dimly lit, like just an amazing bar downstairs that you kind of go through a secret like a uh, kitchen door to go downstairs. An amazing place, right? So I remember meeting Andy Spade um, there. And we actually were here at the, at the at the top, so where um, you kind of get your drinks and your tacos, and then we went downstairs to this bit later on. And he was such a cool guy, man. I remember reading quite a lot about him and. Uh, but I didn't know much about his wife at the time. And I remember what well, I remember from that conversation of how highly he spoke about his wife. And it might sound weird, but I come from a family where most of the men in my family treat their wives like shit, right? Um, one of my uncles who recently passed actually um, from a stroke. He had a stroke in his sleep. He had a, he, then it was discovered that he had like two different families in di two different continents, right? Which was fucking bizarro. And then the fucking funeral was an absolute shit show. I heard it was like a world star thing. People were kicking off and fights happening left, right and center. So, I come from a family where, uh, you know, a wife is is kind of like a childbearing robot, right? You kind of go in, impregnate them, and then you go out and kind of live your uh, bachelor lifestyle. Even and but then you're hiding each one, right? So I don't really have a I don't really have a problem with polyamory, but at least be upfront and let the person know that you know I'm in a relationship or I'm in an open relationship or I'm, I have the option to have other partners. But hiding people in general and being a shitty dad and a shitty husband is just something that I've been I've always been exposed to. So when I went to New York and I was speaking to Andy Spade and Heron and at that time Heron had a girlfriend who he used to put on his on his blog all the time. At that time, um, obviously Andy Spade was married to Kate Spade, this influential designer and they were both alphas because Andy Spade had his own thing too. Literally, literally he used to do books, insulation, part of just, they were just a, an amazing power couple, right? Both operating on really high ends of the cultural and artistic uh, landscape. So then to come back and to hear this kind of really sad story that she unfortunately took her life is so, so, so gutting, man. Like, really, really gutting. And, you know, they've got a young kid as well. And, you know, there's rumors about maybe they had marital drifts and stuff, which I don't really care about. You know, someone's life um, was taken or they took their own life. And now someone's sister, mother, um, wife is not around anymore. It's just bummer, isn't it? And then with Anthony Bourdain, which was, it hit me even harder because... Andy Bourdain is kind of the starting point for a lot of the people that I look up to in the podcast, comedy, um, entertainment industry, right? They kind of frame their whole way they look at things or the disappointment they have in their career or the things that they're aiming for based on what Andy Bourdain was able to do with no reservations. Um, he came in, he, he came about in my life during a time where I wasn't very appreciative of food. I used to always say food for me was like a fuel source, right? It just I just make sure I keep myself alive. Just That's, that's why I eat. But then I also, but then uh, to contradict myself, I had a very, I had, I've got a very, I've got sweet tooth and I love processed food, right? At the time, because that's why I, was, I used to be super fat. I used to be like 260 pounds. So I used to love eating fucking crisp and chocolate, but anything that, to, anything pertained to like actual real food, like pasta, rice, whatever it may be, I'd kind of like you know, turn my nose up at it, which is fucking ridiculous, but you know, stupid fat guy shit. So um, Andy Bourdain came around during that time where I was kind of a bit like, eh, over food. And he made me appreciate it in a whole different way because he was able to relate it to culture, right? He'd able to go to these different neighborhoods, these different countries, different cities and sit down with people and actually break bread for real. Not in this weirdly manufactured, sterile way that um, other shows did where they, they really kind of went in and gave the whole place a lick of paint and kind of put in the right amounts of lighting to make it look more fabulous than it was. He went in there and sat on those plastic stools like he did with Barack Obama in a dingy place somewhere, right? And ate their food, drank their beer, you know, like didn't order anything off menu, ordered exactly what all the locals eat. And if anything, he was always known for asking whoever his fixer was, whoever the restaurateur was, whoever the host was, what they would eat, right? And have actually eaten that first, kind of getting appreciation of their food instead of eating the kind of the pacified Western version of what they eat that they kind of serve to tourists. And also he very, he ignited my travel bug, right? That was during a time where I hadn't gone anywhere, but I also knew that the life that I was living before of buying Supreme every week and, uh, double taps and every other Japanese brand like babe and all that stuff all the time and not making anything for myself or not exploring a world and becoming culturally aware and becoming worldly and having a, a philosophical standing or reading because he used to quote an, he used to quote an amazing amount of books and his little opening monologues of no reservations and and the layover it really opened my eyes to kind of get in, diving deep in those kind of things and it also by a weird way right which is kind of gonna sound crazy but it also kind of led a lot, to, it kind of led to my mild depression that I had whilst I was living at home. 
I was living at home and I fucking hated it, right? Like me and my mum, especially my mum, we were had we were having so many arguments. Um, it was during a time where I was kind of waking up to the idea that I had to leave the house. I was regretting the idea that I went to a university in London in Central St. Martins and I decided to stay at home and not go in campus because it was too expensive. And I just had a shitty time at university. It didn't feel like university because I was, I was in a, uni, a London university. Most of the people in my class were foreign. So there wasn't a real uh, way to kind of uh, speak to people or hang out. The people that were from London had their own friends. I so didn't want to hang out anyway. So we left with no one really to chill with. I only made friends really in the second year. Um, and at home, I just didn't, I felt like I didn't have any independence, right? My parents are super conservative. They were always very, very um, hesitant to let me kind of live my own life or do my own thing. They were very, they kind of tried to molly coddle me, even though I was very independent from day dot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I probably didn't help the situation myself by being very combative in that situation. But watching a no reservation, seeing this guy who came from a very bleak past, right? He had overcome drug addiction, had made had made something of his life, met um, met a great girl who he had a kid with, uh, produced his own TV show, written an amazing book in uh, Kitchen Confidential. It really bummed me out, right? I felt like I should be doing that too because he, here's somebody who made it, who made, who was a complete loser, basically, who by his own words, um, before the age of 40 and kind of suddenly then became like one of the biggest um, cultural culinary stars out there. Um, obviously, most of it was due to his complete hard work and amazing talent, right? That voice is probably never going to be replicated again um, in food. But it kind of made it kind of shone a light on my life and made me think, wow, I'm not doing shit, right? Every time you watch this guy, he's in another far from place somewhere, play, somewhere, a place maybe you might not have even heard of, right? And he's eating amazing food and connecting with amazing people or uh, just seeing amazing sights. Just amazing, 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 amazing. And I got really bummed out, really, really sad because... And this lends itself to the idea that Jordan Peterson says in, in uh, tw uh, 12 Rules for Life, right? There's one rule in there. No, sorry, in general, where he says, um, clean your first, clean your room first before you criticize the world, right? Get your own house in perfect order before you criticize the world. Now, it's, it sounds like a throwaway quote that you could find in, in any fucking Instagram page. But I guarantee you, if you live at home with very conservative parents or parents that think they know the best or parents that think they can't make mistakes or very just conservative parents in general or religious parents, right? Cleaning your room buying your own food right um even just painting my i remember when i painted my room white like fucking hell man it was weird like so it caused such a rift in my house i remember um get buying my own food was a lot of it was a big concern when i started doing keto diet and stuff whatever making my own salads and stuff my mom was criticizing that my dad was getting really angry about that and it kind of was in their in their point of view it looked like i was spitting at their feet right i wasn't i was taking the house for granted like i thought i was better than them in some regards so when jordan peterson says to people especially the millennials to you know get your own house in perfect order before you try and revolution before you try and go out there and do gun reform or change uh, the hierarchy or or strip down or or break down the patriarchy, whatever it may be, get your house done because that that strength of resolve, the battle that you have to go through in your own home, right? Just to fucking buy your own food or to come or to come back when you please, right? Is immense. And if if anything, it will toughen you up for the battles outside of outside of life. But if you live a life where you're generally always given what you want and you suddenly step into the real world and you're met by challenges the first thing that will come to your brain is like, oh, I need to change everything, right? I need to fucking change the system, become an activist, which necessarily isn't really the way to, way, way to go about things. Fix yourself and then you fix the world. So I went through a bit of a slump with Jordan Peterson, but then, I mean, sorry, with, through Anthony Bourdain actually watching the show and I stopped watching it and then I started watching it again and I started watching Layover. But then during that time, I also did a bit of self-work and I kind of got my own life in order and aligned myself in the, in the right way. And one of the things that kind of helped me do that was to write a list down of the things I wanted to achieve for myself, right? Not based on what Anthony Bourdain was doing, but on my own, on my own, um, on my own back. And I've got a list here that I found. If you're not, if you're not watching this on YouTube, then um, I'm, I'm going to describe it to you. I just written, this is a list I found from 2011, right? From November, no, from now to, uh, probably I'm assuming from October, September, right? I made like a list of my goals that I wanted to achieve that uh, by the end of the year, 2011. And this is what kind of mended my depression or more, I, it wasn't even depression. I was just bummed out, right? Um, and that wasn't necessarily where I thought I was going to be. Um, weirdly enough, it's weird because I was always told from when I was younger that I was going to be, I was, I was destined for greatness, right? I was special, right? Everyone that met me thought, oh my God, you should be doing that. You should, I've always been, people would suggest 
fucking careers for me, right? Oh, you should be a presenter. You should be a YouTube feed. Oh, everyone's always, everyone's got a suggestion about me, right? And I'm sure they don't. They probably haven't got their own shit figured out. It's fucking annoying, right? So it's sort of like when you decide you want to start uh, working out or do a new diet. Everyone's got a fucking opinion, right? So everyone kind of saw. Uh, everyone's probably again not to be disparaging. I think everyone was found it easy to identify something in me which I probably didn't see in myself, right? So, but with that comes this um, weird sense of disappointment right of failure when you haven't necessarily reached those lofty heights that everyone else is saying that you should have and internally you also think quite highly of yourself right so i had this weird uh delusion of grandeur and a very humble nature where i know i'm fucking the shit but also know I, i'm not shit right this is weird sort of like balance i maintain within myself most of it is an inner dialogue i don't necessarily say this out loud apart from this lovely podcast thank you for listening so but the way i dealt with it was to manage it was to make a list of things and break it down, right? And this list from 2011, I'm going to hold up to the camera now. Uh, I'll describe the list so you guys can see it. Hopefully, it kind of shows up. It basically says what I want you to do. Number one, complete insanity. Number two, drop weight to 200 pounds. Number three, jog more. Number four, eat more healthy. Number five, sleep better. Number six, finish transcribing Love Fever interview. Number seven, take pictures of the betting shop for the betting shop project. And number eight, do more, speak less. That list, right? what kind of rejigged my whole insides made me recalibrate everything and put me down the path that was that was gonna eventually lead to me being where i am now right i'm a i don't know good functioning human i contribute to society you know good house got brunette here chilling nice group of friends doing my own thing on the side but that was able to i was i stopped having fomo i stopped looking at others and uh uh, kind of judging my success base, my, judging my success based on their successes, or thinking I'm a failure because I'm not necessarily where they should be, right? But Im imagine, the, imagine the stupidity of it, right? Me at 19, 18, living in my parents' house, comparing my life to a 40 year old. Even if he was a teenage star, right? He has a track record of, he has a, a rap sheet, a CV of experiences, right? I don't have shit, right? I think at 19, I must, I might have had two jobs, if that, right, in my lifetime. And I'm comparing myself to a 40 year old, but it does happen because you're watching TV, it's accessible. Anthony Bourdain is a very um, personable person, right? He's very down to earth, he's super funny. He's kind of like the every guy. He's like the uncle that everyone wished they had. Yeah, you know I mean, like, so you can, it's easy for your brain to decide, oh my God, like, he does, he's a human, he does that. Why can't I do that? And that's not necessarily how things go about, but that's what, that's why I can understand what can easily lead you down a depression wormhole. But that really helped me making this list really, really helped me because it kind of it kind of allowed me to kind of get centered and figure out, no, 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 no. You have a lot to do yourself in your own career, right? In your own thing. You have so much to do right now for yourself. The last thing you need to be worrying about is what bloody uh, Anthony Bourdain is doing, right? That's the last thing you need to do. And also along the way of doing anything on this, on this list, the process is more important than actually ticking off the, the points. Because if I end up, even if I end up not completing this insanity, right, that beach body workout, the fact that I went through it allows me to, uh, to know where I am, right, in terms of uh, physical capacity. And it also maybe gives me an idea of what I can do next, right? So nothing is a failure. Um, even if I don't drop my weight to 200 and I get it to 210, I've done 210. That's amazing. Even if I don't jog as much as I should jog, I've jogged already. So it's given me a bit of a taste for it and showed me that maybe it's not as hard as I think it has. I think it will be. Everything has a positive to it. And the process is what the positive is, not the end goal. And that's what eventually leads to curing, in my opinion, my my own depression. Because I had something to aim for. I had a target to go for. I wasn't sitting there, like, bummed out about my own life and looking at someone else's successes and thinking, fuck, I should have that. But I also know that depression, for most people, it, it's not as simple as that. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's just a lot more muddy, right? That internal monologue is just so fucked up. That's why I kind of started this podcast in the first place. I wanted to make sure I wasn't speaking to myself because I was speaking to myself all the time. I'm always kind of having these long, convoluted conversations with myself, right? And I wanted to get it out there because it, it's not it's not healthy sometimes because you can convince yourself that you're not doing shit. You can convince yourself that you're a bum, that you're a failure when you're not really, right? By all senses of the world. And you could also convince yourself on the opposite scale, right? Like that 30-year-old guy that's living at home with his parents and his parents took him to court to chuck him out. You could also convince yourself that it's not that big of a deal. Like, why, why, are, they, why are they trying to take me to court for? What's wrong with them? I've already told them I'm going to find a job and I'm going to, but I need time to get on my feet. There's Your mind can do weird things. So, I don't know, man. I guess the lesson to be learned from this, I hope, isn't that oh, this goes to show that if you're successful, you also have your own issues. If you think that, you're an idiot. You need a lot of help. If you had, if you had to wait until someone had to commit suicide, 
for you to realize that maybe celebrities aren't as happy as you think they are you there's something wrong with you because that means that you are waiting for this arbitrary number to appear in your bank account you're waiting for your followers to go up a certain amount for them for you to be all of a sudden happy that isn't going to happen you have to work on yourself now at this position that you're in now whether it's fucking stacking sandwich boxes in on, on a shelf in Pret-a-Manger or working behind a bar somewhere right whatever shitty thing you're doing that you don't like or even working in an office for an amazing company that you hate right even whatever you're doing you have to work on yourself at that point in time before you decide that you're gonna find happiness through a boyfriend a new job a holiday a new possession it doesn't work that way it's all inside it's all inner it's all inside and i've and i've got to a point now where i could give a fuck what anyone's doing right i'm so i'm so focused on my own journey it's, it's insane like i generally don't care like, it doesn't affect me the way that others are getting affected. Like, the Kanye stuff, whatever, threw everyone off and everyone was going crazy, whatever. It's like, I don't care. Like, I know the world is unfair and fucked up. And, like, even the Greenfield Towers stuff. Like, the, the reaction from the government wasn't surprising to me, right? Like, if anything, the way the residents were able to band around, right, um, get their resources together, supply food, shelter for those that were banned, that was what's a real credit to the community. It shows that we can do it even without them. The government's reaction didn't surprise me in the slightest, right? We have to kind of concentrate on ourselves and help those closest to us in order to kind of make this world a better place. But, you know, um, putting your trust and your hopes and beliefs in an in institution and material possession, right, is not the way to go about things because it will lead to down to a path of constantly in this little hamster wheel where you're trying to chase happiness that isn't necessarily there and in general life isn't really a, a pursuit of happiness i don't think so life is basically the pursuit of seeking something meaningful some similar to what jordan peterson would say right seek something meaningful let me actually get this video up and hopefully um, you guys can hear what i'm talking about let me see if i can get it up jordan peterson talking about meaningful meaning finding meaning in your life because obviously I'm, i might end up butchering this uh jordan peterson meaning ba, ba, ba. Uh, meaning let's do me let's let's do meaningful meaning ah, meaningful it was a Swedish uh, p uh, place. Hold on, let me see. If my, is it there? Yes, yeah, it. Do what is meaningful, not what is expedient. I'm, I'm going to quickly play this now so you guys could hear it. But this is this is for me is what life is about, right? Um, obviously, it speaks about life not being. Don't seek like quick gratifications, right? Not instant gratification, which maybe you can lend itself to social media. But the idea that you should always be seeking happiness and you should be this idea. This idea that we've been sold that your life, your end goal should be. To aim for to aim to be sitting in a hammock somewhere and being fed grapes by this big titted Amazonian woman. That's not what happiness is. That isn't. I'm sorry. Happiness is being able to overcome obstacles because you're gonna get more obstacles and you're gonna get moments like that. And you and you only wither away and die doing that anyway, day in day day in day out. But let me let Jordan Peterson say it much better than I would ever say. Play it now. Hope you guys can see. write in the book there is no faith and no courage and no sacrifice in doing what is expedient what do you say to those viewers that don't pursue their dreams and are locked in their careers because they are too afraid to take risks and pursue something mm -hmm. meaningful well the first thing i would say is well you should be afraid of taking risks and pursuing something meaningful but you should be more afraid of staying where you are if it's making you miserable it's like the first thing you want to do is dispense with the idea that you get to have any any permanent security outside of your ability to contend and adapt it's the same issue with children it's like you're paying a price by sitting there being miserable you might say well the devil i know is better than the one i don't it's like don't be so sure of that the clock is ticking yeah and if you're miserable in your job now and you change nothing in five years you'll be much more miserable and you'll be a lot older but isn't so, it a luxury to pursue what is meaningful? Our viewers have mortgages, they have children, yeah. they have payments and loans. It's well, a luxury to pursue because we, we lack the resources. Well, I don't think, I don't remember now, I'm not talking about what makes you happy. It's a luxury to pursue what makes you happy. 
it's a moral obligation to pursue what you find meaningful. And that doesn't mean it's easy. It might require sacrifice. If you need to change your job too, let's say you have a family and, 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 and children and, and a mortgage, you have responsibilities. You've already picked up those responsibilities. You don't just get to walk away scot-free and say, well, I don't like my job, I quit. That's no strategy. But what you might have to do is you think, well, this job is killing my soul. All right, so what do I have to do about that? Well, I have to look for another job. Well, no one wants to hire me. It's like, okay, maybe you need to educate yourself more. Maybe you need to update your, your curriculum vitae, your resume. Maybe you need to overcome your fear of being interviewed. Maybe you need to sharpen your social skills. Like, you, you have to think about these things strategically. If you're going to switch careers, you have to do it like an intelligent, responsible person. That might take you a couple of years of, of, of effort to do properly. When you say pursue something meaningful, I love that, right? I thought that was an amazing um, way to kind of uh, succinctly put that point across. And I guess it can apply to a lot of us, um, especially those who are kind of trying to find their feet or trying to um, get to a place that they deem as being happy. And I like the line he said, you know, um, uh, having a job that makes you happy is a luxury, which I agree with, right? I think along the process of finding something meaningful to you that you're going to do or fi or i always subscribe to the idea that you know having shitty jobs will eventually get you to eventually make you appreciate having a a good job because i even sometimes i've worked with people before who you can clearly tell they've never had to work a shitty job they've been fortunate enough to always have on paper good jobs but because they've been so spoiled they don't know what a shitty job is they are bummed out by stuff that you think is just not that big of a deal right like having i've worked service jobs in stores where you've had to work every day basically you're 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 you have you ha you're obliged to work every day every calendar day every calendar day of the year except for christmas that's the only day shops are closed right in london especially so imagine having that schedule where you're always on call where some weeks you're working six or seven days in a row it's fucking insane so I think if you're somebody that has that high experience, you don't really necessarily appreciate what you have. But I also think sometimes going through the shitty job, eventually to get to the decent job, to eventually get to get a good job, is what makes life meaningful. And eventually, if that if that leads you to getting having a meaningful job that you feel like you're giving back to society, then so be it. But this idea that seeking happiness is the be on end of life is fucking ridiculous, man. Like you have more challenges in life than you have happy moments. Happy moments. Everyone knows that. Everyone knows that's recognize that and enjoy those but how do you overcome setbacks and bounce back from them especially when you keep getting them again and again and again like especially if you're on rejection number 121 what makes you want to get up in bed and do it again you know what i mean like that's what makes life like really meaningful that's what gives you that backbone you know that base that doesn't make you freak out when someone in government does something that you don't agree with or a celebrity has a little social foo -ha. And says something that you don't like, right? That's what that's what that's what allow you to be strong, have your own resolve, have your own point of view, and yeah, man. I guess for the most part, like I said, like if you if if you've only taken away from this that uh, celebrities are as fallible as us human beings, and you know not everyone that has money is happy. Then I, I really I really worry for you. I think that's not the, the thing you should be taking away from it. What you should be taking away from it is that if you were somebody who thought that. In, uh, likes, followers, money, clothes, cars, women, men were going to make you happy. Um, that is proof that it doesn't. And there's now, not everyone's going to commit suicide, but there's some people that are living in internal hell. You've heard so many people say it, like they'll go to an event with loads of celebrities and, and really high uh, status people and everyone's kind of a bit shit, right? Like mood wise, everyone's bitching about something or da 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 and it's like, wow, you would have thought it would be different, right? But they're the same as you. They have their own issues. Like the issues just get high. The issues just go up a level. It, it, every bracket has their own issue, right? It might be, an, it might sound annoying to you, but it's still an issue, right? If you're a mum and you can't get your kid into a certain private school, it's annoying. So when you overhear these mums complaining about it in a, in a bar somewhere in Notting Hill, it might make you, it might, it might bend, bend your nose out of shape, but that's a real problem that they have. So, so, so to suggest that because she has free cars in her driveway and her kids wear expensive clothes that she's not, she doesn't have a problem is fucking ridiculous. But even to, even to hope for they have a problem is stupid too. You need to concentrate on yourself. Get your own house in order before you start picking and choosing your idols even. Or before you start even getting, you know, emotionally invested in what they're doing or not doing. But yeah, in general, it's sad. I repeat to Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain, man. Thoughts and prayers, guys, to their family and everything. And 
yeah, I hope this can be a lesson to all, man, to appreciate the time that we have on this planet. It's very, very short. Um, and yeah, try and try and do meaningful work. Try and connect with your friends as much as you can. Enjoy the, your life, that you, the time that you do have, because it's very short. They decided to take their lives and, and kind of tap out. But eventually we're all going to go down that same path anyway. You know, there's no escaping that. Um, for some of us, we might have this weird thing in the back of our heads where we think Elon Musk is going to save us and make sure that we live forever, but I wouldn't count on that. And would you even want that anyway? Especially after watching Westworld, right? All the hosts are being, are, are kind of being, um, their consciousness is awaking, right? And they want to, especially for Dolores, they want to swap their lives for, they want to swap their bodies for the bodies of humans so they can grow old gracefully, right? So that they can, their kids can grow up and all that sort of malarkey. So it's interesting, right? So it's the idea that we want to live forever, the humans, the guests, but the hosts want to um, have the option to end, to kind of have an end of their life, right? They want to be able to die and kind of, you know, whatever and continue on to the next life or, or whatever that may be. So be careful what you wish for and also concentrate on what's in front of you and if you are struggling with things in life maybe make a list like i did you know make a list of things that you want to do especially in a short time in a short time frame i think that was from the september i'm going to say and then try and tick those off and along the way i i, I would assume your neural cortex would get fixed man because i know mine did my wives were all fucked up man i was living at home i didn't have a penny to my name i was watching all these influential amazing people do amazing work i was friends with heron press and all those kind of people and i'm seeing them being super successful and i'm living at home fucking twiddling my thumbs and affordable bed thinking fuck you know what i mean but then the moment i fucking got this list down i was able to get my stuff in order and now look at me hey talking into a webcam on youtube man <laughs> oh shit anyway um next topic on the docket living a life um what else I wanted to talk about? Oh, so yeah, London nightclub accused of charging black women twice as much as their white counterparts. Hmm. Um, I saw this pop up on my social feed and I immediately was, I thought it was bullshit, right? Now, the only reason why I say I thought it was bullshit is because I am um, familiar with the central London landscape, right? Especially night life, nightlife wise, because I used to DJ there. In the beginning, when you're trying to DJ, especially in London, because everyone's a fucking DJ in most metropolitan cities, right? Um, I'm assuming so, right? I assume it's the same everywhere. There's more DJs than there are opportunities. Usually, the places that give you opportunities, the places that you can find on Google, if you type in, I, I want to DJ somewhere or whatever, or DJs, blah, 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 um, openings, you sometimes will stumble upon these entries from nightclubs in uh, Soho, in South or Central London, that would offer DJ a spot to play, like an hour or 30 minutes, but they're usually in the fine print, once you start going back and forth with them with the, on, over email, they'll let you know that they're not going to pay you, and the only reason, and the only way you can get paid is if you bring people down to a party, which was, you know, fucking stupid, because sometimes a party will be on like a Wednesday or a Sunday, right? Like something really dumb. You never get the spot on a Friday, because usually, you know, they've got their own people who they kind of res um, trust or respect, blah, blah, blah. So I know the I know how it kind of works there, right? And I know that most of those clubs are um, in are kind of frequented by people who are kind of all the same, right? It's very vanilla, right? Um, they have a certain dress code. They don't allow a certain kind of clientele in their in their nightclub, regardless of color. I say that because I think mo for the most part, London is a classist society, or England in general is a classist. But I wouldn't say it's mostly racist. You might get a few weird looks if you go outside of London, right? I remember me and the brunette went to Shropshire near Wales, and you know every sec, every every two, every person was you know giving us do dodgy looks, right? But for the most part, it's because you know there's a Spanish girl and a black guy in London, in fucking mi in the middle of Wales countryside, walking around, right, trying to find a cafe, right, to, to have some breakfast. So I get that, right? But you're gonna get more of a hostile reaction outside of England than you are outside London, and you're gonna get in London, right? For just because you know most people have seen a black person or somebody of color within London. But there is a thing, sort of thing about class, right? Where if you speak a certain way or you dress a certain way, people judge you instantly in London. It's a big thing here, right? So we have this idea that you know you have to kind of strip away your hoodness, right, or your streetness in order to fit in with kind of their demographic and if you go to a nightclub in london usually it's what they want you to look like they don't want your personality they don't want trainers or tracksuit bottoms or jewelry or anything loud for the most part you have to wear hard sole shoes maybe a blazer maybe even a tie so if you imagine if you're a guy and those are the things that you have to wear immediately look most of your wardrobe most of your wardrobe that isn't that has been excluded 
You only have a small portion of things that you can wear. So there's only so many color combinations of blazers that you're going to make you look at an individual. You're all going to look the same, really. So I'd say for the most part, if you were to go to a London nightclub, right, take a picture and somehow edit out everyone's uh, face, arms, or anything that can pertain to their skin color or race, I'd, I'd, I'd assume most people look the same outfit wise girls in bodycon sparkly dresses high heels guys in contrasting um blazers with like different color lapels from the body and shit um weird trousers that are kind of high kind of like rolled up with like loafers like everyone's got the same sort of look it's a different it's a particular look that they want in that nightclub and it's generally not based on color it's generally based on class like how you sound what you look like the feel your feel right or the vibe and usually the cheat code for those places is just to get friendly with the promoter and you can dress what you, how you like and kind of just slip through on a guest list. But for the most part, when it comes to girls, it's a weird thing because usually what they do with girls is that they're a lot more superficial than they are with guys. So promoters that work at these nightclubs, because no one will be using promoters nowadays, right? You have, you have a Facebook advertising that you're able to target who you want. You can target people on Instagram, on every other social, maybe even on Snapchat if you want to. There's all these tools that allow you to promote directly to people that you want to get in contact with. You can get a, a kind of Instagram model to kind of maybe post a flyer of your event or to maybe say she's going to attend there. Whatever you can want to do, right? There's ways that allow you not to use a, a promoter anymore. But some of these nightclubs are quite archaic in their approach. So they still use promoters, right? So these promoters are under the, are under the directive to only have the most hottest people in their nightclubs, right? Because if you've got Rihanna and all these kind of people approaching your nightclub, you're not going to have some dodgy looking people there too, right? You want the kind of glossy image right? that people trade in your nightclub, which is bad, but hey, it is what it is, right? They don't really pretend to be anything else, right? So Central London's clubs are superficial in that regard, but more so to women. So this promoter will go out and he, during probably um, four weeks before the event or maybe even longer if he wants to really make some money, because he's, you know, he's, um, his earnings are primarily based on how many people he can get through the door that are his people, right? So he will go out and promote the event and he will purposely seek really hot girls, attractive women. For the most part, uh, women who most men will find attractive. Women who will generally fall in like kind of the kind of the middle zone, which kind of, you know, general majority of England happens to be white. So be predominantly white girls, right? Now, there might be different t tones and tans types but for the most part white women there might be a few kind of like you know brown child there might be a few um kind of other races might be some arabs or whatever or maybe a kind of cover mixed race girl but for the most part really hot white girls you'll get them and say to them hey um the, the club that i work at usually charges this price but i can get you this price if you come to my event or he might even say i'll get you in free and then what ends up happening is that this West Central London Club will put this event on. They'll advertise it as starting one time and it'll start four hours later than what you expected it to. So you turn up there two hours later thinking you're just on time and it should be popping now. You'll join the queue thinking, oh, it must be fucking ramming there when it isn't. So it purposely make you queue outside even though no one's inside or not, not many people are in there. And then what they'll do is that they'll put the guest list queue right next to the normal queue, right? The kind of um, general entry or public entry, whatever... Uh, general ticket right so then what ended up happening is that those girls will arrive at about 11 they'll strut down the street in their amazing dresses looking super hot walking past the queue guys and girls will be like jealous about like, oh my god i want to be next to the hot and beautiful people they'll get through the queue and they'll get and they'll get in and then you have this false idea that the club is popping but this story i think was bullshit because i assume that when because basically i have read the story now let me read the story now and then I'll, I'll tell you my opinion let me read the story hopefully let me get this up on the screen so, zoom in a little bit here. Like that, and zoom in. Drama, drama nightclub denies a, a, alleged racist door policy. So it says a London nightclub has denied allegation that it, it charges black women double the entrance fee of white women. Nadine Marsh Edwards claimed on Twitter her daughter was asked to pay twenty pounds at drama nightclub in central London, while white women were being charged ten pounds. Right. A drama spokesman told Newsbeat, we don't we don't tolerate any form of discrimination against any any individual or group. The club says it's investigating the allegation. And you can see the tweet from the mum that says, my daughter went to a nightclub in the West End last night. Black girls got charged £20 entrance fee, white girls £10. London life right now. Um, drama nightclub says the standard door charge at its Parkland club is £20. Promotions are offered for various reasons, right? That's a good point to make. But never on the grounds of discrimination, race, colour or national origin. We operate... Um, 
a non-discriminatory policy and we place a strong emphasis on diversity and inclusion all the buzzwords in that sentence so you can just throw that one away drama describes itself as a regular celebrity hangout claiming to attract the likes of drake rihanna and exit rocky it's for those who seek to thrill shock those who aren't afraid to speak their minds express themselves fucking funny in it nightclub in central london speak their minds you get thrown out mate um anyway so i called bullshit on this why because the bit here at the, at the top says promotions are offered for various reasons right which means they're kind of passing the buck. Promoters are the ones that are responsible for most people that are coming into a nightclub, right? Because they don't necessarily have their own event booker. They're usually outsourced to other people, especially for a promoter that's, that's, that's got like a, a big rep. So if you're the promoter, and even if, let's say he got all these white girls to come to his nightclub, right? Amazing. Girls that weren't black, right? Let's just say that. It's not racist. He just, he just, he just happened to, that's what he likes. I don't know. I don't know why he did it. Let's say he just did that, right? And then he's told the girls, Okay, um, I'm going to allow you to come into the nightclub. It's usually 20, but I can give you a tenner, for, a tenner only. And maybe Drama Nightclub is well known around the kind of like that kind of scene, right? That kind of central London scene, right? Maybe it's a well-known club and people want to go there anyway. So maybe the girls are happy paying a tenner because it's usually 20. And maybe on top of it, he might tell them, look, I'll get you a table and I'll give you a drink spend of this, much, this amount of money. For, knowing full well that it might... It's gonna, it's gonna work. It's gonna work in his favor because boys are gonna see those girls there. They're gonna try to buy them drinks. Girls are gonna want to be like those girls the next time. They're gonna try to be friendly with the promoter. And Jerome's gonna create a good vibe, a good superficial kind of like service level vibe that all Central London, all Central London club want, right? They want the look, right? No one's really dancing. No one's really having a good time. Everyone just wants to be. Everyone wants that look. Everyone wants to be around beautiful people, right? Cool. So if you're in the front of the queue and these girls come steaming down with their amazing outfits and you're these black girls in a group at the front of the general queue and these white girls come beside you and they pay a tenner to get in and then when it's your turn, they're charging you 20, you're going to be like, what the fuck? Right? You're gonna, it's going to be a bit weird because usually most clubs, especially Central London clubs, they usually tend to like advertise girls are free before a certain time and then they're usually always charged less than boys, right? Because the general hypothesis is that um, boys usually go to nightclubs to see girls and girls usually go to nightclubs just to see each other. They don't really fucking care either way, right? But it's like, if you get girls to come to nightclub, you're always going to get a group. But if you, if you get good looking, attractive girls to go to nightclub in London, especially in Central London, it's not everywhere. Not, not the clubs I like to go to. But those kind of clubs, if you get hot girls to be in your club, it, you're going to get hot, you're going to get guys, not hot guys, just guys in general, like fucking armies of them coming through and they're going to fill up all the gaps, right? So for that club, it's like, it's win-win for everyone, right? Uh, the girls get all the hype, they get loads of Instagram followers, and the guys get to oogle hot girls in bodycon dresses. But I, don't always, I wouldn't say it's racist, in my opinion. Again, I don't know the d details. Maybe the investigation will prove that the club do purposely charge black people less, but I mean, I mean more, but I doubt it, man. There's probably security guards there that are black. There's probably people that work in a bar there that are black. I don't think they'd allow something like this to go down. Like, it doesn't make that much sense. I think, in general, the promoter um, who night that was on that particular evening happened to speak to a group of really attractive white girls who came down the door they all paid a tenner to get in and then the black girls in regular queue had to pay 20 like the usual entry free and you know they all kicked up a fuss and here we go but it's a bit weird because even if it if it's true okay we're sorry we'll take it back and we'll change our policies and stuff but even if it is true i'm a big believer in you know if people aren't welcoming you in their establishment just go somewhere else we live in London, man. We have one of the best clubbing environments in the world, right? Like, in the world, I'd say. Like, there's so many options, right? If you want to... Maybe Berlin has us um, stumped on many other facets, but not a music policy, right? If you if you like indie, if you like metal, if you like jazz, if you like um, African music, wherever you like, you can go and party until 2 a.m. listening to, like, if you want to. You don't necessarily have to go to these kind of places. And I think, for the most part, the free market should judge these places better than kicking up a fuss on social media because for the most part especially if you think about it, loads of central london clubs have closed down and, and been renamed over the years i can i can name so many of them and most of the reasons because they were there's some sort of controversy happens a fight breaks out someone does something weird someone gets assaulted blah 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 blah, blah and then they have to <coughs> adjust to the times and rejig so we end up always winning anyway. The customer always wins because we just walk away and don't go anymore. And then they can't function because they can't pay six security guards and 10 bar staff and the DJ and run the lights and all the other shit and the drinks and stuff without people in there. If there's no people in the club, then the club is fucking done for. So if anything, if this, if this story is true, the girls should get all their friends, band them around and just kind of boycott the club. That's it. Done. Boycott the club and go to a club where it's happy to take your money. There's so many places out there that willing, ready and willing to happy to take a group of black girls in their club. Like, do you know what I mean? They don't care. They're not about the superficial life. But I think if the club is superficial, just don't go there. But if it isn't true, just putting out a tweet and 
uh, potentially sinking a nightclub or ruining his reputation based off uh, anecdotal experience is fucked up as well. Do you know what I mean? That's a fear of, of public shaming I'm not really a fan of, man. I like the public shaming where you're held to account, you know? You can apologise, make your changes and then move on. But the public shaming where even if it isn't the truth, you can't really take this back anymore, that's the bit that I don't like. So let's see how it goes. But I, don't, I doubt it's a fucking race thing. Even if it is a race thing, don't go. Go to another club that's happy to take your money. And Central London clubs suck anyway, man. Who the fuck wants to be there? Like, honestly. Like, really? In your own free time? Like, fuck that. Um, what else? Oh, shit. A Cold War Spring Summer 2019. Wow. Uh, Samuel Ross fucking smashed it. Absolutely smashed it, right? So, I've been a big fan of A Cold War from its very inception. More so because of Samuel Ross, right? Um, I'm a big fan of the person before I'm even a fan of the product in general. I think so. That's probably my weird kind of point of view on when it comes to these kind of things but i did try to get a last minute invite to this show but i couldn't i didn't succeed too late i guess in the day uh i had worked with samuel a few times and and um he's a sister no he's well, his partner um ace who also does a brand with him on a cu couple of projects at my other job that i had before and he came across as a very knowledgeable guy super intelligent and he had a very unique perspective on fashion in general and i really saw what he was trying to do with what he had at the time, right? The resources he had at the time, he was trying to do so many cool and interesting things. Whether it came with, whether it come from trainers, accessories, the utility bags, he did his, like. I don't think you're. I don't think you're gonna see a bag on the market that looks anything, anything like the a Cold War uh, side bags and stuff. They look so unique to anything that's on the market at the moment. Everyone kind of does the same iteration. Everyone's kind of doing an iteration of a Supreme satchel, right, or a Headporter side bag. Everyone's kind of doing the same sort of thing. But his bags are very, very unique and very, very uh, particular, right? In the way that they're done. And they have a lot of, there's a lot of intellect behind these designs, right? Um, sometimes he has this tendency to do a bit of a word, word salad stuff, right? Kind of similar to like Mike Eric Dyson. It can kind of get a bit annoying. But in general, I think his voice is super, super necessary in, in the fashion landscape that we have now at the moment. Um, especially with all the attention that Virgil has garnered. It's great to see that Virgil's entry into the fashion scene, his appointment to Louis Vuitton, has suddenly cast a light on all these amazing designers, you know, that aren't necessarily prescribed to the general um, kind of template of coming out of this big fashion school and turning at this brand and then suddenly going and do their own brand, which I don't do anyway. No one really launched their own brand, but for the most part, it's good to see different voices being highlighted in London because we, we, if it, if London, if if anything is a melting pot, London is. Everyone says a uh, culture melting pot. No, London is for sure a culture melting pot. You get in a central line from any point and you're going to see so many different color creed races shapes and sizes on, on the whole thing right so his collection was amazing um his collections have been amazing but recently he's, he's had some big investment um he's been represented now by carla otto that I only learned um through uh trying to get into the show so there's a lot of um you know a lot of buzz around samuel ross and what he's doing on a cold war he had a cfda nomination like there's a lot of goodwill happening behind him a lot of people behind, behind the scenes are kind of rooting for him right so this show it kind of felt as if like it's kind of like his big debut, even though he's kind of shown a lot in London and he's he's kind of been a main fixture within the London uh, creative circles. He talks on panels. He's you know done a couple of interviews here and there. His name's around. I thought this was the real debut of what a Cold War stands for and what they're about. And what an entrance they fucking made, man. What a fucking entrance. So I'm going to show you the video here. I'm going to get it up a bit. And hopefully you guys can check it out on, on the screen. And then we're going to go through a bit of the collection bits. But I was going to show you the, kind of the first bit. So imagine starting a collection like this, right? First, the space. Like, of course. Amazing, right? This fucking rundown factory, it looks like, right? Sawdust probably flying all over the place. Um, extremely rustic. Just great lighting. That's it. Just, you know update the lighting maybe gave it a bit of a sweep some uh very artistically or design specific place tape on the floor benches and that's it bare as you can get and then look what walks out an army of concrete fucking soldiers right i don't know if they're all women but if they are that'll be fucking insane to a little kind of nod to the current climate that's going on at the moment with these amazing touchable hoods that i love and the trainers there's a thing that Sammy Ross does at right, Cold War that he's been very, I'm very um, enthralled about is that he does his own shoes. You know, sometimes there's a weird little detail that he kind of gets a shoe and kind of reappropriates it, dyes it, takes off the laces, cuts the swoosh, like just fucks it up so it fits with his collection. So, that, so the models aren't just wearing fucking weird shoes out of the blue, right? Or they're not covered in anything else. And I thought it was insane. 
so these models are out here walking, right? Storming, storming, storming. I'll fast forward a little bit more. And then after this happens, the collection starts and you're like, wow, this dude is a fucking talent, right? You see this come out. One of my favorite pieces of all the black bags touched, touched onto it. Look at this, look at the bags. That's what an urban explorer should look like, right? I hate that fucking term. North Face and these other places used it. But the idea that, you know, living in a metropolitan city, especially living in a concrete jungle, you don't necessarily have a car and you have to carry everything with you. But it has to be done in the kind of uh, tasteful, utilitarian, functional manner. Like everything has to have a purpose. You can't just be pockets for the sake of it. And Jesus Christ, it's so good. And that's why it reminds you so much of Rick Owens. Because I remember Rick Owens saying in an interview, he always designed his jackets to have enough room to put a book, a sandwich and something else, right? And... You, you get this with the Sammy Ross stuff, like with the Cold War. It's just so, so functional. And the kind of play on fabrics. Look at the see-through joint here. This top looks amazing. I think someone like Wiz Khalifa would look amazing in this, exactly. Especially since he's gone, he's gone so, he, he's uh, getting ripped up and getting bulky. The pants look amazing. Yeah, I think Wiz Khalifa would look amazing in that top, actually. Um, yeah, just a generally amazing collection. So all these different shapes, the accessories look sick. That guy that's coming up just now behind this one. That bag looks kind of like Le, 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 Le Cabossier, if you pronounce his name. Um, Lamp. It looks similar to that. I love these trousers. You know what they, the trousers remind me of? They remind me of, you know, when, the, when you get a delivery sometimes, you get those um, plastic airbags that kind of make sure everything gets put inside. It's sort of like he's, he's kind of slid those inside of his track pants. They look fucking amazing. They're kind of like stitched inside the fucking pants themselves. Like fucking awesome. And from what I've seen online and stuff, everyone kind of raves about the bottoms. They say they're absolutely amazing. So yeah, look at this. It's just insane. So I'll just fast forward a little bit more to so some other bits that I like too. This, these fucking performance piece structures that he's going in. I'm not sure if it's kind of like a nod to like a car, right? Going through the ends. But again, the shoes. Look at the shoes, man. He does his own thing with the shoes. Changes them up, tapes them, you know, color blocks them, whatever it may be. So they fit in with his collection, right? Because you see Comme des Garçons and Junior Watanabe, they always have a, a shoe collaboration with every with every launch, right? With every kind of a runway show. But obviously, if you're a young upstart brand, you don't necessarily have that luxury, right? To kind of have your own shoe collaboration. So it's kind of, it, I guess shoes can be the only bit that you can kind of like falter on a little bit if you don't have an early collab. Or if you don't even want to, maybe you don't want to, um, put your align yourself with a brand out of the gate straight away that defines who you I mean you don't necessarily want to be a Nike Adidas boy straight out of the gate you kind of want to be able to move around yeah in kind of Hiroshi Fujiwara fashion and kind of do collaborations with everyone um, and don't and not kind of limit your, your yourself so I guess this is the kind of best way to do it but in general I just love it I love this approach Yeah, so just all all amazing work. Like, just so good. I love it. I saw someone actually in Central Line wearing that, wearing a T-shirt with this massive block, uh, this sort of, like, detachable uh, logo in the back that you can kind of take off. You can kind of uh, cut off the washing tag, the kind of tag that comes on the, the, the front or the side of the detachable hood. I saw someone wearing this big, massive T-shirt with a massive Velcro patch on the back of it. It looks fucking awesome. And, of course, the casting, man. The casting is so good, man. Um, there's a lot of talk. There's a lot of talk about diversity in fucking fashion at the moment, which I fucking hate because um, it's just the fact. It's just it's just like um, ticking off quotas, right? Like, oh, we've got three three blacks, four whites, uh, three Chinese people. It's, it's stupid. I think brands should reflect their consumers. They should reflect the, the the influences that the designer is kind of pulling from. If you're influenced by North African culture, then maybe you should have people that look like they're from North Africa do the runway show. Just common sense, isn't it? Um, but I think. A Cold War does a great job of the casting because, number one, you know, I'm sure Sammy Ross has a, and the Cold War have a great community of people who kind of, you know, cover a wide, uh, a wide ranging of races and backgrounds. But for the most part, it accurately represents what it is to live in a tower block in London or in an estate or in a council house, right? You, you are friends, all you, your friends don't all look like you. You all look like you're from everywhere. It's like, it's, it's like the United Colors of Benetton adverts for real, for real, right? So, this is just this is just how you grew up. Like your friends just looked different, and maybe if you all stayed in the ends, you'd all just look the same as well. But it's like you know you all look different. Simple as that. So I like that the casting is just like kind of matter of fact. It's not even done in like a kind of oh we've got white, we've got black. So no, it's like this is my friends. Just all look like that. Like I have friends from everywhere in school. It just was one of those things. It wasn't you know what I mean? Like it is what it is. But the casting's amazing. That girl looks fucking awesome. I love the way they did her hair. Yeah, and in general, just just great, right? So amazingly well done. 
by somebody who's not a trained fashion designer, right? But comes from a very uh, storied fashion background. I'm pretty sure I read somewhere that his dad was an architect or an artist or something. He's obviously got a degree in architecture. Is it architecture or graphic design too? Uh, he's obviously been, he's obviously worked in agencies. <clears throat> he's assisted with Kanye, with Virgil. And then talking about Virgil, so they go on, to, uh, this, this show was amazing. I was watching some of the analysis um, on Show Studio and they referenced Virgil, who's sitting there, as you can see in the green top. And they were saying, oh, because um, towards the end, there's an amazing crescendo, which I'll show you in a minute. And they're saying that, oh, this is basically a, a little nod to Virgil saying that, you know, he's kind of flying his wings and doing his own thing and coming underneath from his shadow and blah, 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 or that it's putting pressure on Virgil. And it was annoying to see that because I think no one says that with designers that aren't black, right? Like, not, 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 not to get into the whole identity politics sort of thing, but why should it be a contest be, between these two guys just because they happen to be black and happen to hang out with the same sort of people? There shouldn't be a contest. It shouldn't be a battle to see who is the last designer standing. They both operate in different worlds, right? They both have different interests. They both operate on a different level, right? So, but they can both coexist through the mere fact that Simon Ross was able to learn and craft and kind of refine his vision underneath Virgil and then do his own thing shows you that they can both learn from each other. It's a, it, they, they kind of work in, they, they work in unison. You don't get one without the other. And if we're being completely honest, we don't get a Sammy Ross without a Virgil anyway. Virgil has to open that door and show that it's possible and give and uh, allow the fashion literati to kind of throw their arrows at him, all his balls at him. And then whoever comes behind has less balls to be in front of them. And the one who comes behind Sammy Ross, a bit less more. But you're still going to get balls thrown at you, but not as many as maybe Kanye get, got when he first debuted in Paris, right? So this idea that, you know, Sammy Ross is somehow overtaking Virgil and Virgil must feel under pressure, is fucking ridiculous, I think. And it's so annoying. You don't hear this with any any other white designer out there doing any amount of other bullshit that they're strutting down the Paris Fashion Week shows, right? It's just what it is, right? So it's like, it's very, very annoying in that respect. And and it kind of, um, it kind of trivializes the hard work that's been put in by these guys, right? And and the kind of level of cultural significance that they've both risen to where they're both being courted by hedge funds, by uh, investment bankers. Virgil is being headhunted by LVMH Group to spearhead Louis Vuitton men's. Do you know what I mean? That level of cultural significance is is something that shouldn't be scoffed at, right? Like, and I heard a lot of them on Show Studio talking about, you know, maybe this is the natural evolution of streetwear, and streetwear needed to get to this level. It's like, no, like, no, again, streetwear isn't what you're seeing from Virgil. Streetwear, by its definition, is t-shirt, hoodies, and jeans and sneakers, right? And there's a plethora of brands out there that operate in LA, New York, London, Tokyo. Uh, places in Hong Kong who are off, who are supplying people with standard streetwear that they love. One of the biggest streetwear brands is probably Kith, right? That's a store, right? That's they do, they do as basic streetwear as you can get, right? Hoodies, jumpers, t-shirts, uh, tracksuit bottoms, jeans, shorts, like that world will always exist. But there was a group of designers within streetwear, right, who always wanted to kind of um, uh, cross over to the field of fashion. And at that, and before even a Virgil, even before even a Kanye, it was always kind of tricky, right, to kind of earn that validation, that kind of credibility, because they didn't necessarily get it. Even though most of the models, even though most of the casting agents, even though most of the people that organize after parties always booked people that were from the streetwear world, they didn't necessarily give them the opportunity to play in that kind of playpen, right? They're always kind of just given the after parties and then told to kind of stay out of the real business. But now we we've kind of taken control I've kind of I'm saying we because you know I'm 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 of the culture I've been involved in this industry for a long time um gay 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 I know allow I'm cringing I'm throwing up in my own mouth but I've seen the progression and I've seen that as much as there's people like Virgil and Samuel who obviously want to be fashion designers there is a strong contingent of kids out there too who don't who just want to be streetwear kids but they also see what Virgil and Samuel are doing and now they they're infused it's it's encouraging to say oh sick our vision, our aesthetic can uh, can lend itself to a fashion house, right? Like someone like uh, Phil that does Dirtbag, right? Or someone like, um, what's his name? That does uh, Stray Rats, right? They have as much design sensibilities as anyone from a fashion house. But can they carry that language across a fashion house? Probably something that's maybe up for debate. But it's to say that they have to evolve to the point of fashion is ridiculous because not everyone wants to dress like that. Not, guys, for the most part, don't even want to be fashionable. Guys, for the most part, just like clothes. That's why women's runway shows are usually more um, pleasing to the eye than men's fashion show because men, women do fashion much better than guys do. It's just a, a fact, right? So 
that was something I wasn't really fond of. And someone else said on the on the panel too that Virgil might have too many pies, too many fingers, and too many pies. That's why his his fashion is kind of uh, not hitting as much as all the other stuff he does. And it's like no, like you can't separate one and the other. Virgil's where he is because he's has so many strings to his bow right that all feed into his um design work that all feed into his dj sets that all feed into his photography that feed into fly design all these sort of things they all feed into each other you have to be like that the, in this industry nowadays i think someone mentioned it in the panel you can't come into the game just being a designer anymore you can't come into the game being a stylist just being a photographer you have to have other interest or other points of reference that you're able to connect to that feed into your work but just to say i'm going to take pictures and i'm only going to look at people that take pictures you can't do that you have to travel you have to look at pictures that aren't necessarily in your field pictures of uh football matches pictures of nightclubs right you have to explore you have to travel right you have to maybe uh do a sport play an instrument right have a hobby something that's able to feed into your work because coming into it just 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 your art alone you're going to be left behind unfortunately we're living in a world of the hyper pollinate or whatever the, the, the slash slash the aka aka right so you have to have <clears throat> various bows to your string or various bows no various strings to your bow and virgil's kind of a consummate um example of that and so is samuel ross he designed the soundtrack or the soundscape uh for this uh fashion show he, I'm, I'm sure had a hand in the styling of it, right? I'm sure he has a stylist in it, but I'm sure he had uh, a kind of final say on it too. He probably has a final say on the design. He probably was instrumental in the art pieces, right? He designed a little flyer, loads of the little marketing bits and bobs that they put on Instagram. Those, that's already a, that's already six jobs title that he has a, a, apart from being the business guy apart from being the creative director apart from being the founder of his own brand. There's already six other jobs that he's doing there. So, so it's not a coincidence that his work is going to look this amazing, given some money, given some backing, given some money, given some fucking investment. And that makes me now realize what Kanye was talking about when he was kind of ranting a raven about um, getting sponsored by the Medici family. or Where's my Medici family to kind of like um, propel my dreams forward? Because now you see the level, the, the kind of finesse, the level of finish that Yeezy stuff has got to now. And it shows you that you need that backing. There's no way that you can operate on that level or, or supply that many people in the world and not have that level of production behind you. It's impossible. So at that high level of production, you need investment. You can't just do it on your own. So, or you need some form of investment. Maybe like a Rick Owens, like where you give away maybe 10% of your company, right? And you keep the majority of it. But you need something. You can't operate on your own completely. You need some sort of help, some sort of backing behind you. And I'm happy to see that given the backing, given the opportunity to really perform, he fucking turned up, man. He fucking turned up. I remember Rio Ferdinand saying, ages ago and he put it i think in an air force one that if you're from the hood and you want to be a footballer the 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 common thing that we used to always tell ourselves i remember we saying it before we used to play in the cage is that we will always make ourselves ready so that if one time arsenal Wenger was driving through our state and his car broke down and he saw us playing he'd think we we're ready straight away he think we we're ready like and if we're given the opportunity to play in front of an open in front of a packed stadium for arsenal or man united or any other big team we perform and that's the idea of like you're great already you're hood great you just need to give him the resources in order to perform. And if you look at the first question of a cold war, you could always see a, a thread of greatness there. There was always something that separated him from what everyone else was doing. And if I'm if I'm honest, I look at the collection, it reminds me a lot of the old um sorry of the I think 2013, 2014 Rick Owens, where the guys are like hanging off the hanging off the rafters. Hopefully I have it here. Where is it? Yeah, I think it's this one. Where they're kind of hanging up. Do you remember that one? Where they're hanging up the rafters and they're planning of playing. There's a guy playing a guitar. It's that kind of the stomp, the stomp era stuff. So it kind of reminds me of this a lot. And and imagine imagine someone comparing your small brand that you started with your friends, right? That's only what three seasons or four seasons in a Cold War to to, to Rick Owens, one of the most widely respected, um, influential, well-run businesses in fashion. Now you must be doing something right. And yeah, it reminds me a lot of this. Uh, it reminds me of a lot of that. And the other, what's the one with the stomp where the girls are kind of banding around? So yeah, and with Rick Owens, he's got a particular design language and a particular uh, tone that he just refines season in, season and out. And he does the same thing. And obviously the shoes too. It's just, just amazing. Just amazing to see what Cold War has been doing. So congratulations to those guys. 
absolutely smashed it. Um, absolutely amazing. I can't wait to see this stuff in stores. Going to pick up some bits and pieces for 100% sure. And yeah, man, I think let's not compare both of them. Let's not pit them against each other. People say, oh, now Virgil has to, he's going to, he's got a lot of pressure behind him for the show in Paris. Dude, Virgil ain't under pressure because of what Sammy Ross does. He's under pressure because in general, people think he's a chance or he got there by chance or by luck, which is not, you know, which is fucking ludicrous. If, you, if you're sitting there and you think Virgil's only there by chance, you're fucking nuts. You don't become the creative director or artist director of Louis Vuitton by chance. I'm sorry. It just doesn't happen that way. He's become culturally relevant enough where his voice is being connected to youth. People, these storied fashion houses, you know, Louis Vuitton kind of wants, to, wants that consumer in their stores, buying their stuff, tweeting, Instagramming about their clothes. So what better than to get someone that's tapped into the millennials um, tone of voice to kind of lead spearhead that thing and he's obviously at a point where he has to kind of evolve and develop his brand and kind of reach the lofty stages and it also i've always said i've always pictured off-white being more of an undercover thing right so it kind of being a real experimental kind of platform they can kind of like test really kind of strange wacky ideas or you're kind of doing that at the moment it's still not probably where it should be right it's still not that great i think the women's stuff is probably better than the men's anyway it still kind of looks a bit sloppy it kind of fits a bit weird on the models even on the online store it looks a bit shit it looks a bit boxy i don't know if that's the shape that he wants but it just doesn't look that well done right but i'm assuming i would hope so that under the tutelage of Louis Vuitton, with their resources, with their atelier, with the kind of with the with the design assistants that we have working there, the interns, the, the level of product we have to put out will be of a high, 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 high level, much higher than we've seen anything that he's done so far. And we've seen, given the opportunity, you know, given the resources, with stuff he done with Nike, I think he mentioned in an interview that he was he felt really under pressure with the Nike. Um, project because if it was shit it kind of felt like you know he would have he would have got deleted from the scene but he smashed it man like the nike 10 for the most part it was a 10 out of 10 i thought that collection and it's probably apart from the yeezys they're probably the only collection i've seen people actually wear in real life that you know like they're actually wearing i see loads of people wearing the 97s the 90s the air force ones the jordan ones that i have um the court the the blazers the converses everyone actually wears the shoes so that is testament to his uh design sensibilities that people were even though they're very expensive even though they've got a high resale value people are like no nah, you know what these shoes are fucking sick i'm gonna wear them um so yeah let's see what he does i'm excited man we've got we've got fucking kim jones at, at dior uh, in paris We've got Celine, we've got um, Heidi Semaine at Celine menswear debut, which will be amazing. I think that's what everyone's really looking forward to. And then, of course, we've got Virgil at Louis Vuitton. But it's, it's so encouraging to see someone like um, Samuel Ross doing such good, high-level work. And I can't wait to see what he does next, man. Um, well, oh, yeah, shit. Let me show you the end, actually. Let me, let me show you the, the crescendo. The crescendo was fucking amazing. Um, so the crescendo goes like this. Maybe a sign to like, you know, him breaking down the walls, right? So all these amazing clothes is coming out. And then look at this. Oh, sorry, I skipped it too far. This block comes out with the same st concrete structures. Breaking down the walls, tearing it all down, right? Smashing it all. Amazing performance piece. They all run back in. And then look what emerges from the middle reborn my own man now naked not afraid guy's got a bit of a piece on him too to be honest flaccid and is dangling man he's got the detachable hood on as well so a nice current theme running through the whole show boom pushing that boulder up a hill what's that greek philosophy uh, thing where oh shit remember there's that, there's that greek story right where he pushes the boulder up a hill and the whole idea behind it is that even if it rolls back down again it's the beauty is in being able to roll it up the hill and down again, roll it up a hill and down again. There is no end point, right? Maybe that's part of it too. Who knows? But yeah, fucking smashed it, man. Imagine that being your fucking debut fashion show after the big investment. Fucking money well spent, man. Big, big, big congrats to all, all the Cold War team. Um, yeah, smashers. What's next on the fucking docket? Um, let's see. Blah, blah, blah. Um, no, 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 no. You know what? That might, that might actually be it, you know? Maybe that might actually be it. Let's see what, what time I'm running at now. One hour 20. That might be a good place to end it. Well, I could work out talk about here. Why why can't we hate men? Oh, that article on the Washington Post. It just made me angry, man. It just made me angry and pissed off people out. You know, 
this identity politics thing is fucking getting way out of hand, isn't it, really? Right? People are going fucking crazy. Um, but essentially, this article came out the other day in the Washington Post, written by a lady by the name of Suzanne Duante Walters, right? And the title, I'll, I'll put the actual page up now on the screen so you guys can see. Show. So why why can't we hate men? Question, right? And they fucking put the pe- the face of Harvey Weinstein, right? Not necessarily the best representation of men around the world, I don't think, right? Bit unfair, that. Anyway, the article starts off by saying this. It's not that Eric Schneid, whatever that name is, the non the non the now former New York Attorney General accused of abuse by multiple women pushed me over the edge. My edge has been crossed for a long time. Before President Trump, before Harvey Weinstein, before mansplaining and insoles, before live streaming sexual assaults, red pill men's group, rep camps as a tool of raw and a deadening banality of male uh, prerogative. So obviously she's putting her, she's, she's setting forward her fucking, she's putting her foot down and saying, you know what, enough of all this men going around and fucking girls who don't want to fuck them back, right? And she's had enough, basically. She's, she's over the edge. Next bit. Seen in this, uh, in this, in this beautifully true context, which is fucking bizarre to say because, you know, it's not true if it's only your truth. It seems logical to hate men. No, it doesn't. I can't lie. I've always had a soft spot for the radical feminist smackdown for naming the problem in no uncertain terms. I've rankled at the but we don't hate men uh, prote- uh, protestations of generations of would-be feminists and found the men are not the problem. This system is object obfuscations too precious by half. It's like, come on, man. This this girl's a fucking psycho. But of course, the criticism of this blanket condemnation of men from t- transitional feminists to decry such glib universalism to US women of colour who demand an intersectional perspective are mostly on the mark. These critics rightly insist on an analysis of male power as institutional, not narrowly personal or individual or biological based of male bodies. Growing movements to challenge the masculinity built on domination violence built built on domination and violence to engage boys in and men in feminism are both gratifying and necessary. Please continue. No, I'm not going to continue with that. Especially if feminism is what it is now, right? Which is the um the ima- the the emancific what you call it? What do you call it? Um if if feminism is the idea that you want to strip men of their masculinity right you want to effeminate you want to make men more effeminate in order to somehow rebalance the odds you want to somehow uh, enforce these quotas that allow companies to hire people based on their race or their gender prim- primarily and not on their ability to do the actual job then i'm not a fan of it sorry that's not the feminism that i'm, I'm supporting because it's what it shows is that these these people that have identified as feminists, they just get, they're just fed up of always, they feel as if that like they've been victimized their whole entire life, right? And the the big bad boogeyman or the person that they're kind of pointing all their eye towards is men. And in order to, re, in order to kind of uh, reestablish balance, they want guys to kind of give back their power and they want the power instead, which isn't necessarily the way to go about things, right? Um, anyway, let's continue the article. But this recognition of complexity of male domination, how different... It can be in different parts of the world. How racism shapes it should not, must not mean we forget some universal facts. I'm not sure these are going to be facts, but let's go with it. Pretty much everywhere in the world, this is true. Women experience sexual violence and the threat of that violence perm- permutates our choices, big and small. Mate, people f- experience violence, sexual violence everywhere. Everywhere, it happens everywhere. It's not like a, a purely woman thing. It happens everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. This doesn't necessarily mean that's a that's not an that's not a representative of what the patriarchy or what the dominance hierarchy is. That's not what it is. Like it's just a, that's just the world in general, right? There's shitty people everywhere. In 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 addition, male violence is not restricted to in intimate partner attacks or sexual assault, but plagues us in the form of terrorism and mass gun violence. Women are what? So you're saying that what women are targeted in terrorism and mass gun violence? I don't know if you're just saying that. Maybe I understood it wrong. Anyway, women are unrepresented, unrepresented in higher wage jobs, local and federal government, business, educational leadership, and etc. The wage equality continues to permeate every economy and almost every industry. Women continue to provide far higher rates of unpaid labor in the home. Uh, women have less access to education, particularly in the in the high levels. Women have lower rates of property ownership. Like we all know the wage gap thing doesn't exist um we all know especially if you're going to judge if you're going to judge whole swaths of women whole, whole swaths of men 
it doesn't get down to the it's you're just judging people based on their group identity and not on their individual choices right um if men are not able to procreate that immediately takes them out of being out of the workforce because it makes them it frees them up to be available to work for 60 year, for 70 plus years of their adult life right um women have the ability to procreate which takes them out of the workforce for up to a year right um also women are more agreeable than men so they're not necessarily going to ask for a higher raise right they're not necessarily going to do everything it takes to make the company successful to earn that bonus right they're not driven by material things as as men are there's different things that come into it like and even if you are working in a comparable job and you're getting paid less it's illegal for that to happen you should complain you should take them to court you will win all the time you will win it's a standard way of doing things and if you're talking about high rates of far rates of unpaid labor i'm not sure what that means but i don't know there's not many women saying they want more women in the fucking construction industry right it's fairly dangerous it pays quite well but it's fairly dangerous like i don't see many women ch um plotting for that and even when they do encourage women to do stem uh areas of um uh, to kind of go into the stem industry what's that science technology engineering and maths whatever it may be right they don't choose it they're not really interested in it it's like you know and this goes on it varies by country but these global realities of women of women's economical political social and sexual vulnerabilities are well and real indeed the nations in which these equalities have radically minimized as the ig iceland are those in which deliberate effort has been made to both own up to gender disparities and to address them directly but it's interesting if you look at iceland they made a big concerted effort to get more women involved in the different areas of industry but for the most part, the more they encourage it, the more women stick to what they want to do, the traditional women jobs, and the more men go towards the traditional men jobs. It's really strange when you, when you force, when you enforce equality of outcome, people tend to side with what they actually are, maybe, I wouldn't say biologically uh, trained to do, but they, they, they usually um, tend to go for things that fall into their lane, whether it be childcare, whether it be engineering, which is kind of very, very, very interesting. So in this moment, here in the land of uh, legislatively legitimate toxic masculinity, it is really, is it really illogical to hate men? Yes, it is illogical because how can you hate all men? It's stupid. You're comparing all men to Harvey Weinstein. You're comparing all men to some fucking uh, what you call it, a uh, heartless corporate guy out there that doesn't care and will sack you if you go on fucking maternity leave. Or he'll give you uh, half of what his male counterpart is getting. That's not representative of all men. All men don't ascribe to that sort of idea. But let's not have the whole balance of power swing towards the other side completely. That's not going to fix anything. If anything, it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna breed contentment within your own ideological group. You're, you're seeing it nowadays that like, there's a split within feminists between white feminists and black feminists. Black feminists don't feel as if like white feminists um, represent their issues in the right way, right? White feminists are afraid to get involved in black issues because they don't speak about black issues. They only speak about uh, the stuff that concerns them, which is what identity politics is about. Which is the problem of identity politics because it's always concerned about your own group. And if your group isn't being representative, what you're gonna do? You're gonna go out and get your group represented. That's why feminists hate men's group because they've been they've been attacking men for so long men are the problem uh their patriarchy blah 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 then the men get upset then they form their own little men groups which are fucking ridiculous right and then they go out protesting and you've got these two groups uh, battling it out for what we all live in the same planet mate Let, let's just make the world fairer right not not guarantee equality of outcome by kind of opportunity no matter where you're from you should have the same access to opportunities as everyone else has now whether or not you're going to be good at them is a different different topic or overall but to hire someone based on what they have in between their legs is insane like insane and it damages everyone in the long run the, t the team suffers the company suffers the industry suffers. everyone suffers if you're going to hire people based on their gender or their race it doesn't work that way and if there is an underrepresented group within your company, they, that, that is something that has to come from the fucking, the top down. It's something that has to maybe be analyzed overall. Are people within this kind of community being, has access to this sort of, these kind of industries, these sort of jobs? Are the people they're looking up to promoting working in the science areas or whatever it may be on the, on the STEM research fields? Probably not. And if they're not, maybe open up those avenues first and then let them choose for themselves as apart from sh shoving it down their throats. So yes, it is illogical to hate men. Like fuck, woman. Anyway, we continue. The for all the for all the power of me too and times up. 
the women's marches, only a relatively few men have been called to task because that's how the court system works, motherfucker. It takes ages. Everyone knows that. It's just fucked up. It takes ages. That's it. I'm sorry. And it's very hard uh, after the fact to prove someone raped you. I'd assume so, right? A shame, but it's very hard. The, I thought the benefit of Me Too and Time's Up wasn't that people were going to get locked up for 25 years and whatever. My prob- my thing that I thought was a, uh, good about it is that it brought it all to light because a lot of people in the industry, were, um, it doesn't get said that often, were turning a blind eye to Harvey Weinstein's disgusting acts, right? He was raping people, touching them up, assaulting them long before this Me Too movement came around. And the people in the industry who knew about it, who spoke about it after the fact, oh yeah, I heard about, I heard about, I heard about this, but no one was brave enough to stand up and, and take a stand for it for the most part. Everyone kind of just like operated within their own little silos and didn't want to get involved or didn't want to get blacklisted from the industry, right? So that kind of that that kind of fostered this environment where that was kind of allowed, it was kind of an unwritten rule. And we know what the couching coaches the the, the casting coaches like, right? Couch, casting couch. We know that there is a group of people out there who don't mind exchanging sexual favors in order to kind of get forward in life, right? There's stories out there that, that say, as gross as it is, that Harvey Weinstein was kind of a man of his word when it came to exchanging sexual favors. That like if you did suck his dick for a part, he'd give you the part, right? So imagine that's happening at, with somebody of his caliber. Imagine what's happening all the way down with indie movies, art house films. Imagine what those guys are getting up to or those guys and girls getting up to, right? And everyone's kind of allowing this to happen. It's fucked up. It shouldn't happen at all. Why should why should that be uh, a thing that happens and it's allowed and accepted? Because what's going to happen is that the guys that guys and girls who don't mind exchanging sexual favors in order to get forward in life are going to be silent, right? Because they're doing their job. But the ones that are suffering and ones that don't want to do it and don't know what's going on and don't have anyone to turn to, those are the ones that suffer. So this industry kind of fostered this whole environment anyway in the, in, in the first place. It wasn't even a men thing. It was everyone was involved. Harvey Weinstein, one of his, Harvey Weinstein's best friends was Oprah Winfrey. Do you think Oprah Winfrey didn't know about what was, that, what was going on? Real. Come on, for real. Like, I'm in a fucking shitty um, nightlife uh, druggy drinking crew, right? Uh, subculture, whatever you maybe call it, right? Or community in London. And even I know things about some people that they probably don't know I know, right? And I'm sure they know things about me that I probably don't know, that I probably don't know they know. You, you know about these things if you hang out with each other enough. People gossip enough and tell you some stuff happens. Blah, blah, blah. You know. So if you heard Oprah didn't know. Come on, man. Anyway. Um, relatively few people have been wrongdoing. On the contrary, cries of witch hunt and the plotted re- resurrection of celebrity offenders came quick on the heels of the outcry of uh, endemic sexual assault, harassment and violence. But we're not supposed to hate them because hashtag not all men. Yes, you idiot. I love Michelle Obama as much as all the next women, but when they have gone low for all humanity history, maybe it's time for us to all go Thelma Louise and Foxy Brown on their collective butts. So to go high... <sighs> the world has little place for feminist anger. The world has little place for anger in general. It doesn't achieve anything. Women are supposed to support, not condemn. Offer, su- offer succour, not, di- not, not dismissal. We're supposed to feel more empathy for our fear, for your fear of being called a harasser than we are for your women to be harassed. No, you should meant to, you're meant to be responsible with your words, right? If you're, if you're the, like that Garrison Keillor guy, right, who, um, her, who a uh, woman came to the office who needed consolation, some Garrison Keillor, Google him if you don't know who he is, a woman came to the office and went to be consoled about something that she had went through. Uh, I think a breakup or something. Garrison Tequila was consoling her. They were kind of, they were, I guess they were, fr- they were friendly enough with each other where she'd come to his office and have a chat. He hugged her. He, his hand kind of kind of lowered a little bit. She got a bit She got a bit offended by it. Not a bit offended. She was a bit freaked out by it and said that was a cotton called for. He emailed her, apologized, and he kind of mended it and was okay. Right? So he fucked up, right? He t- tried to touch her bum and she didn't want him to touch her bum. You, you shouldn't do that. He did, But he did, right? Um, he's a guy, he tried to make a move and she called him out and said, no, fine. He stopped, fine. He apologized after, fine. They agreed it was okay. All right, I, I accept your apology. That we, we can move on now. Everyone's cool. Everyone's cool? Everyone's cool. Then this Me Too stuff happens that pops up and she pops up and says she was a solo bad Garrison Keeler and he loses everything. Everything. He's stripped of everything. Now that isn't fair, right? So when people say you should be careful with your words, you should be you should be uh, conscious of what it's going to do to the harasser. That is true because your your bad experience with that person, right? Your one anecdotal bad experience might not necessarily be um, a good reputation of that person's character overall. It might not. It might just be a bad date. It might just be a. It might just be him being too drunk. It might just be someone reading the signals wrong. These things happen, right? In order, what's that Jordan Peterson quote? Um, 
in order to get to the truth, you have to kind of say something offensive. We kind of have to risk the we have, we have to risk maybe offending each other. We have to maybe risk maybe overstepping the mark in order to figure out if you like me or not. That's how most connections work. With, before Tinder, when you went out and met someone, you went to chat with a girl, you have to kind of go through no's and fuck off and someone's chucking a drink over your face before you realize what to say. Right? And what, is that sexual assault, right? If you tap a girl on the shoulder, you want to get attention because you want to talk to her or have a dance or you're in a club and you maybe wind up behind someone and then they tell you to fuck off. You, you can't then go to the paper and say I sexually assaulted you. I tried to make a move. You said no. I left it. But to lose everything on that basis, that is fucked up. That's why you have to be conscious of your words. Not to the extent of like, um, what do you call it? Uh, facilitating or kind of, hiding the wrongdoing of sexual assaulters as like Harvey Weinstein done. The whole industry did that. No, if he's doing something fucked up, you should call it out. Of course, call it out. If someone's fu if someone did something bad to you back in the day, no matter how long ago it was, tell someone about it. But don't but not an anecdotal experience that was that a one off experience that you that he's apologized for, you both kind of were uh remorseful about it and now all of a sudden you kinda of want to change your mind. Like come on man, that's fucked up. We're told, uh, la, la, la. we're told it's with uh, he's with us and not him. But truly, if he were with us, wouldn't this all have ended a long time ago? If he really were with us, wouldn't he be, be reckoned that one good way to change the structural violence and inequality would be to refuse the power that comes with it? Refuse power? What does that fucking mean? It's a competence hierarchy. If you're good, you get the power. But with power does come corruption. And when corruption happens, root it out. But it doesn't mean power is evil. Doesn't mean I have to give you my power in order to in order for it not to be corrupt. That's a, that's that's the thing that I realized with this, right? All this social justice warrior stuff. It's they mask it under the under the veneer the, the veneer of like uh uh trying to do good, right? It's like a selfless act, but it is quite self-serving, isn't it? Really, they want to take away the power from one group and just give it to another, and they're under this weird self. They're under this weird assumption that somehow their group isn't going to be corrupt. That they're not going to take the piss with shit. That there's not going to be any um, fucked up shit going on in their group. And it will. It's just, this is, this is the nature of power. Fucked up shit will happen. Anyway, um, we have every right to hate you. Uh, anyway, so the end of it is, is fucked up, right? So, men, if you're, if you're really with us and would like us not to hate you for all the millennia of world you have produced and benefited from, start with this. Lean out so we can actually start stand up without being beaten down. You want someone to leave in order for you to kind of get the position. Like, come on. Like, shut up. Like, what? Pledge to vote for feminist women only. I'm not doing that. Uh, don't run for office. Not going to do that. Don't be in charge of anything. Fuck off. Stay away from power. Fuck you. We got this. No, you haven't. We we have got this together collectively. Not just women, you silly idiot. Um, and please know that your crocodile tears won't be wiped away by us anymore. Who's getting crocodile tears? You... God, we have every right to hate you. You have done us wrong because, hashtag because patriarchy it is a long past time to play hard for team feminism and win. Yo, this woman's a fucking psycho, man. Absolute psycho. That last paragraph is like, oh, um, yeah, the woman's a psycho. Um, you can read the, the, the article for yourself, but if this is what feminism is, then I'm, I don't want no part of it. And this is the problem of identity politics. You know, you root so hard for your group when another group stands up opposing your group, you get offended. It's like, what did you expect, dude? Like, this is not the way it was meant to work. But I guess everyone has their own battle to fight. Anyway, one last topic to end it before I head off because I don't want to have my head hurting. Oh, shit. To end on a fucking good note, this amazing review. Amazing review, right? So, um, uh, let's see it. What is it? There we go. Highlight this bit. Hopefully you guys can see it. Show. So, um, I'm a big fan of Berlin, as you guys know. I love going to Berlin. One particular place I love is the Bergheim, this lovely establishment here. So this magazine called The White Review, which is having an event soon, I think, in London. I'm going to hopefully go to. Let me try and get up, actually. So maybe if you guys are in London, you might want to go there. But um, there's a magazine I didn't really know beforehand. But it's this woman called Julia Bell wrote this amazing article, an amazing review of um, Bergheim in Berlin, which really describes what I hate about London and what I love about Berlin, right? What I love about the Berger in general, right? The kind of idea that um, every every bit of wrongdoing that's happening in London like life, which it kind of is a bit shitty, but you can kind of sometimes find some pockets that are amazing, right? You can kind of find you know, the guys that are well done known, Andy Blake and those guys make amazing parties, the guys that do Sunday afters, Robert James, those guys do amazing parties too. You can find pockets of people that do great parties, right? But for the most part, clubbing experience kind of be a bit, be a bit shitty. 
but this does a good job of illustrating why I love Berlin or the Bergen specifically. And they're doing an event. Oh, okay. The they're doing a launch party. The White Review number one uh, launch party. Let's see. Uh, what date is it? Yeah, so I'm looking forward to it. So join us for, a, as you can see, they're going to launch party at Bold Tendencies. That's in South and Peckham, uh, 20th of June from half six, featuring Chloe, Adaris, Julia Bell and Lucy Mercer. So that should be quite cool. Uh, Julia, Julia Bell, hopefully she reads the essay that she wrote about the Burkheim because that fucking essay is so good. But the bit that I love is the bit that I highlighted here. I'm going to read to you guys below. Um, so on the Bergheim, right? It's an article called, called uh, Really Techno. And it's great because Julia is like a 40-year-old woman um, who goes to the Bergheim and doesn't take any drugs, right? And kind of has a real cathartic experience. And if you've ever been to Berlin, you'll meet a lot of people in there who don't drink or only do drugs or only do drugs or don't drink or just don't drink and do drugs at all, right? And able to enjoy techno because the assumption that you get from a lot of people that are not involved in the techno industry or in the techno scene is that you can't rave with techno unless you're on drugs. Incorrect. The music, the atmosphere, the lighting, the the audio experience, like the people around you, they all add to the idea of techno. Like that gets you in the, I guess you in kind of in the weird state of euphoria, right? That, that sometimes you don't even need drugs, and you kind of look at your watch, you realize, oh my god, it's fucking six o'clock on a Monday. So this part really, really hit home to me. And she goes, this isn't a club for beautiful people, although there are many beautiful people inside. It's a place that emerged from the East German queer punk scene and what the couple uh, and what that couple didn't realize in their moneyed armor was that the door policy exists expressly to keep them out. To stop the club being colonized by tourists or corporate types, becoming some idea of sleek life like the like the like of Buddha. Uh, Buddha Bar, Nobu, or the Terraces of Ibiza, or some other high fashion hangout where the atmosphere is like a cross between a wake and self conscious teenage disco, where everyone watches everyone else so fiercely that by the end of the evening their faces are flayed with the strain. That bit was so concise, right? And such a good representation of why I hate going to fucking scene parties. I went to like a boiler room party the other day. And I met loads of my old, I met up with loads of old friends I hadn't seen in a while. And it was good to kind of maybe be in that kind of environment. But overall, as a party, it was fucking diabolical. Everyone was watching face, looking up and down, checking out outfits, checking out who says hi to who, who comes over to you. If they don't know you, like, what do you do? Could you be someone that they can network with? It was fucking bizarre. I fucking hated it, right? Apart from my little circle that we had in the corner, where we were kind of moshing out, having fun. Everyone was kind of being a bit passive in general. So I hate that kind of environment. And then as soon as I started DJing, as soon as I started promoting parties, I was exposed to another form of clubbing, right? Because in London, we have this weird split where they're seen, they're seen going out, right? Th that means like going out uh, in all... Because it's weird, because when you read the Holy Terror book by Andy Warhol, right? That kind of um, unofficial autobiography by his assistant, Bob Casello, right? It does show you that back in the day in the 70s, there was a, they did everything, right? So people went to store launches, gallery events, uh, boiler room type events, and they also went night clubbing. They also went to, they also went clubbing. Like they also went to, they went to Robert Johnson in Frankfurt. They went to the place in Amsterdam, I've got the name of it. Um, they went to um, the play, the club in Chicago that everyone goes to. That They, they would go traveling to go to, they would go to festivals, they'd go and actual, listen to actual DJs, right? But in London, we have this weird thing where like people only listen to like, people, there's people listen to scene guys, right? People operate in the kind of scene industry, right? That DJ at, uh, brand events or like a gallery events or whatever or launches or charity events and then there's also another group who only DJs in nightclubs and there's another group that DJ in warehouse parties like a weird they're, and they're all kind of siloed but in my opinion the ones that I love the ones that are in the nightclub and the sort of like warehouse party environment in Berlin the beauty of it is that they kind of that's all one big chunk they're all together I remember once when I went we went to Berlin once uh, for work we went during um, a trade show event we went to an ADAS nmd party that had kano and a few people playing that's fucking amazing and then everyone from there ended up going to another fucking big nightclub somewhere in berlin right so it was the idea of like you go to the actual nightclub you don't just stay there you go to other places which is fucking incredible and you don't necessarily get that in london for the most part and that's why i hate going to sceny parties i just try and go to actual nightclubs actual nightclub party 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 type places but this review was amazing probably the best review i've seen of Berkheim. a very good um description of what it means of what Berlin, of what kind of the Bergheim means to Berlin, how they respect clubbing culture in general, how it's part of their infrastructure, part of their DNA. I didn't know the Bergheim gets a tax break as well, which is fucking incredible. Just in general, it's an absolute, absolute stellar, stellar article, and I can't wait to get to Bergheim again when I visit there soon. So, talking about Bergheim and DJing, I am DJing this weekend, Friday and Saturday at Tap East, 15th, 16th of June. You can find more details at my website, axinozinga.com. 
on the DJ listings or my listings on there. And then again, uh, on the 23rd, I think, of June at the Heathcote and Star for another night of La Betise. That's me all night for four hours playing the best of all the freaky shit. You know, Tappy is trying to be a bit more commercial. Uh, Heathcote and Star go a bit freaky and try and be a bit more DJ Harvey-esque, you know, in my own little way. Woo, woo, woo. So that should be amazing. Can't wait for that to happen soon. Again, as always, check out AxionZinger.com for all the listings of my appearances and all the other stuff, all the other contact deals if you need them. And all the shows will be on the button low the podcast and if you're listening to this on audio why not go over to youtube and like and subscribe tell your friends tell your family i'm here on the youtube sweating in my house but yeah um cheers thanks a lot for listening it's been an amazing experience as ever you know i always like talking to you guys and expressing my thoughts and opinions i'll see you again very soon later on this week for another episode of the agus nozinga show this is episode number 76 thank you so much for listening i hope you guys have a great day i know i'm gonna have one See ya!